Well, good morning all and thank you for being here with us today under these beautiful redwoods. I've actually never seen redwoods in my entire life, but it's pretty stunning. Yeah. Um, so I, I feel very like in awe being here. So um, thank you for being here. I'm not here to talk about the trees though. I wish I was. Um, I'm actually here to talk about public data sets with this lovely panel. So I will just go down the line and say their name and where they're from, and then they'll share more about what they're doing in their respective roles. So I'm joined by Clara Zhao from the Filecoin Foundation, um, Jamie Joyce from the Internet Archive, and then Andrea Mills from the Internet Archive of Canada. And so we are here to talk about public data sets, why they matter, um, what they are, and why it's really important for them to be accessible by the public. So um, I'm going to let you all take it away. So to get us started, could you all share... Um, what is a public data set and why is it important that they are accessible? And we'll just go strike on the line, so I'll start with you. Yeah, public data sets are data that should be accessible to the public. Um, I usually mention we spend so much time in our communities preserving physical libraries, but we forget that digital libraries are just as important, which is why the work of the Internet Archive is so important. But for us at Filecoin Foundation, our mission is to store humanity's most important information. So um, from 50,000 genocide survivor testimonials from the Holocaust um, to um, archiving uh, photographs from what's happening right now in Ukraine, these are data that we think belongs to the public and should always be accessible. However, today there are huge tech monopolies that end up uh, making data a very expensive commodity for a lot of public institutions to be able to afford. And so what we're doing at Filecoin is really thinking about ways to make data accessible but also affordable for everyone. And this is especially true when we think about large, huge data sets, right? Like uh, what Internet Archive is doing with scraping the web um, or in the case of, you know, it could be uh, scientists from UC Berkeley that are collecting genomics data, and they're just trying to collect that for research, but they can't store it anywhere because it's hundreds of thousands of costs otherwise. So that's my definition. I'll pass the mic along. Um, so in the uh, United States Democracies Library Program, which is the program that I'm director of, when we think about public data sets, I would like back up and broaden that a little bit. So for Democracies Library itself, we're interested in collecting municipal, state, and federal government documents, data sets, research, records, publications, web, HTML, microfilm, and microfiche, both n not yet digitized, which we have an interest in digitizing, and then those that are born digital. And so when we think about collections of those, like the public data sets, um, those are the kinds of artifacts that we're looking to get. And then we also have to explore, well, what would a complete collection of these things look like? Would it be a run of specific serials? Would it be a series of technical reports? Would it be everything that's in the NRC Adams archive? And then, you know, how are we going to link that, tag that, make sure it has proper metadata? Because what a complete collection or what a complete public data set is, is going to be different for different stakeholders, for different research use cases. And so those are all along the lines of the things that we're exploring. But in general, those are the artifacts we're looking to collect for the U.S. side. And in Canada, thank you. Uh, Jamie did a wonderful job explaining um, what the Internet Archive is up to. You can hear me, yes. <clears throat> but I think of public data as as um, information data that's been collected by and for the government. This is a public; it's a utility, if you will. We've all paid for it. We all should have the right to use it uh, to explore our history, our future. Um, it, this is this should be um, accessible to any type of user your, at your public library or for, you know, when we're talking about complete data sets, you know, the, the research that's possible on the entire, these huge corpus of um, data. So um, lots to talk to, talk about. Um, I was going to respond to Jamie, but that's not what we're doing here. <laughs> Thank you all for that introduction and giving some more insight on that. Um, Jamie and Andrea, could you share more about the digital, the democracy libraries project from the Internet Archive? and exactly what you all are doing. I'd love to hear more. Sure, yeah, thank you. So we, we have a long history of government info um, relationships and partnerships at the Internet Archive. I started in 2006, and in 2004 and 5, we were, we were starting our digitization efforts in Canada and building partnerships. So we have some you know, digital files that are teenagers that are part of our collection. Uh, so that was some of the first material that we actually we digi we digitized in, in collaboration. So over those years, we've we've built a lot of relationships, um, you know, through these projects. So the first thing we did was um, to revive and expand those um, relationships and partnerships that we already had. 
um, because I think collaboration is the only way that we're going to get this done. Um, and we need to be working with the experts in this area as opposed to, you know, reinventing the wheel. Um, so that's been a very fruitful and uh, busy um, initiative for us, but it's, it's really starting to pay off. So we have working groups in uh, the U.S. and in Canada that are advising us on, you know, where are all the bodies buried? These are professionals that have been working their entire careers in government information, and we want to not only support their work, but, you know, work together with, with experts. So we have been continuing digitization, of course, but also um, working with our partners um, and colleagues at Archive It and the Web and Data Services Group at Internet Archive to, again, bring together the, the uh, partners that are collecting government websites and data. So um, that's been, of course, a big uh, part of our work, um, but, you know, definitely continuing. Um, um, I did make a note here. Let's just see. Um, we're also getting a lot of donations. Um, Jamie was mentioning microfiche, microfilm. That's a big, uh, hot topic in government information. What are we going to do with microfilm and microfiche? Um, so we're accepting donations of physical material and also already digitized, digitized uh, born digital material. There isn't a reason for us to do it over again if it's already available. So starting to bring these silos together. Um, everyone has their stakeholders, as Jamie, Jamie said. Um, but we have this sort of overall holistic look at this entire um, issue, let's say, um, and we're sort of bringing those um, groups together. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I'm gonna pass it to Jamie because I'm sure she has a lot to Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, Andrea has been with the Internet Archive for some time. I'm a much newer member of the Internet Archive team, and so I've been tasked with leading the US division of Democracy's Library. And so how I would conceptualize what the project is, is to describe it as a universal API to government information. And the reason why I was brought on to lead the US side is because uh, I, I've just been a constituent and uh, someone who's needed to have access to government information. I gave a talk yesterday about my Collective Intelligence Institute and how we would mine information from government data sources and how ridiculously painful that was because we'd have to go from agency to agency. We had to look through 15 different agencies just to find one piece of research that we needed. It wasn't really easily serviceable on the web. And so there's gotta be a better way. And like, if we're able to capture all this data and clean it and make sure we have complete collections and put it in one place where at bare minimum, we're able to search and retrieve the information that we need, then you know our hypothesis is that we are gonna be able to accelerate a lot of civic tech and gov tech and research and um, you know, individual projects and potentiate the work of journalists and fact checkers just by making this information, which belongs to us, more accessible. So um, that's a part of what the Democracies Library program is too, is like collect it through partnerships and working groups and like all the relationships that the Internet Archive has built over many years. Um, but also like looking to the future of, and, and really looking a around today at what kind of tools and technologies are gonna make that much more surfaceable. Because especially with these AI search and retrieval engines, not the hallucinating uh, text predicting large language models, but just like a more advanced search, um, we're gonna make this data much more accessible, which is a part of the goal of the whole program. Awesome. Thank you both for sharing that. Um, I love the point about not reinventing the wheel. I think that's really important. So thanks for um, building upon that. Um, Claire, I have a question for you. Um, I know that um, the Filecoin Foundation is working with the Internet Archive, and I would love to know more about how this collaboration came to be and how Filecoin, like their interest in government data sets. So I can pass this to you. Great. Well, we have been huge supporters of the Internet Archive for a long time now, and this was a natural progression of the existing work that Internet Archive has already been doing in government data sets. Um, for me, um, our, our work in the government side actually came from a lot of my personal experience. In 2012, I started an organization in LA called Hack for LA, and that was a period when cities started to explore what does open data mean and how do citizens use data to actually make sense of what could be happening in people's backyards. And so um, I, st I started Hack for LA working with Mayor Garcetti at the time to really think about opening up data and getting developers to build on it. Um, one of the challenges with data today is even if data is open, uh, there are there is a lack of general trust in local and federal government where people are not sure if the data has been manipulated or not. And so even last fall, we supported a conference uh, on smart cities with mayors from all around the world. And 
I talked to a former mayor from the second largest city in Mexico, and he had spent his entire campaign actually opening up data around this contaminated river in his backyard. And the next mayor after that decided just to take all that open data down. And no one in that city actually thought about backing up that data or putting it somewhere. And so those are examples where when we think about data resiliency, when it belongs centralized in the hands of governments, even though a lot of governments are trying to open up, we have to think about it as a whole of society effort where we can preserve it at all angles and also making sure that the integrity of data that is collected uh, really does belong back in the hands of the people. And so that's why it's so important for us at the Falcon Foundation to support amazing initiatives like Democracy's Library. We also um, have an initiative called Public Data Commons where we're working with different cities to really think about opening up their data, working officially with their cities, but also making sure we can store a backup copy of that. Um, there are states like the state of Maine for an entire year lost all the records of its citizens because of an IT failure. And that led to the lack of everyday citizens being able to access court records, function in daily life. We forget how much technology is used in our day to day, but how critical it is that we continue to have a backup copy uh, that, and unfortunately we can't necessarily always depend on local or federal government to, to do the IT job to maintain that. Thank you. Um, I would love to dive a bit deeper on why decentralization is best suited to store this data and to access data over, say, like a cloud um, service. So I'd love to pass that to anyone who wants to take that question. Uh, I think decentralization is really um, key because, like I said before, it adds to resiliency of a data. There's multiple copies. With blockchain, we can really track whether a data set has been manipulated over time. Um, in particular administrations, some people question the validity of environmental data, whether that has been altered or whether that's true. And it's really hard for everyday people to track that. And so I think it's so important that we have multiple sources of the same data set and be able to maintain and preserve it. And also making sure that if there are politics that come into play for pub public data, that uh, we really do have a copy that belongs in the hands of citizens. And I mean, this is something that has been appreciated in the libraries and archives field as well. So in the United States, there's something called the FDLP program, Federal, FD, Federal Depository Library Program, where essentially uh, physical copies of government information are sent out and distributed to different libraries that hold these things. I mean, many of those documents are just in boxes in basements somewhere, and we're looking to uh, collect that data and digitize it to make it more accessible. But in general, there seems to be a principle that having many copies of things keeps things safe in case of like an IT failure or in case of a swamped basement or something like that. So any way in which that could be achieved to the highest level of integrity is fantastic when it comes to critical information like this. Um, and I just want to shamelessly add, when we have these conversations, um, I'm always underlining, you know, governments invest in repositories and websites for their government data you know so I, I we I don't want to suggest that they don't but it suits it's um, targeted to their constituents and it, it is a silo um, and you know of course there can be uh, infrastructure issues there can be business decisions that ha need to be made in terms of you know you only have 250 terabytes this year and you have to start you know picking your favorite children so um, there are lots of reasons why um, uh, it, it's a, a mixed model. Um, cloud storage is important and great, but you know it, it's another copy in the, the decentralized network as well. Awesome, thank you all. Um, what are some of the next steps to getting organizations like government entities, public institutions, and civil society groups um, to motivate it to openly and securely store this data? Um, if you wanna start from this end and work your way back, that'd be great. Um, I, I find that, especially for this project, where we, we're talking about the big sets quite a lot, but I like to bring it down to the, the individual user, the, the person that wants data about their, their li local life. Um, I was having a conversation yesterday about um, recycling. Um, you know, we were, we were digitizing um, all of the pamphlets going back to the beginning of the blue box being rolled out. Um, a lot of that data would be considered historical or out of date and may be culled from a public repository, but it is, you know, it is important. Um, so I, I, as I said, I just like to bring it down to uh, individual users 
um, having the right to, to find what they need and they don't care where it's from. They don't care if it was a, from a web crawl or it was a digitized item or born digital. Um, they just want the information that they need. Yeah. So I would just add that there's going to be a number of different strategies that we're deploying. It's going to depend on the different entities and their relationship um, with the Internet Archive, with Filecoin, with blockchain and decentralization in general. Um, I mean, since we announced this program, we have gotten so many people just reaching out at libraries, at archives, at federal agencies who are interested in participating in the program. Librarians, they would love the shelf space back. They'd love for us to digitize the materials, take it off their hands. We can store the physical items. We can make the digital items more accessible. Um, we spoke with a number of different like um, chief data officer types at different federal agencies who would be super excited if the Internet Archive were to participate in creating back-end infrastructure structure to just automatically collect these things. But of course, the Internet Archive also has a, a number of tools um, that we use to be collecting this data, web HTML, PDFs, videos and things from the web, from these websites. Most of this data belongs to the public anyway. And so in some instances, we'll rely on partnership. And there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm around people just coming to us for that partnership. But we can also just go and get it. Um, and make that accessible to everyone, just like anyone can just go to a, a URL and find this information, uh, especially at the federal level. This information is just ours to collect. Yeah, and I wanted to add to that, um, one of the beautiful parts of, you guys have heard a lot about Filecoin and IPFS this week, but one of the beautiful parts about uh, blockchain technology is we can also change the way that content is addressed. So uh, for those that are not aware, 50% of links to Supreme Court documents, uh, according to a New York Times investigation a few years ago, don't actually work. Uh, this phenomenon is called link rot, right? And so we're working with um, Harvard right now to really think about how do we also make sure that the access um, to the documents beyond just the physical upload and maintenance of it is also maintained. And those are the beautiful parts of, you know, not just backing up data, but also making sure that that access layer is there and we don't lose that critical information. So um, for us, uh, this topic is so critical. Um, I was just on, on the phone yesterday with a chief data officer of a major city, and it's been really interesting also in our work just educating um, people that are coming into technology roles at the city or federal level. Um, if you imagine a decade ago, chief technology officers, chief data officers of cities of um, of, of uh, the U.S., the CTO of the U.S., um, did not even exist as roles. And it's been amazing to really see those roles build up. But also, it's so important that we teach them about uh, how to preserve data and how to really uh, responsibly use it as well. Um, one of the challenges in my career was I spent a few years in U.S. government, and I was actually um, a CTO at Department of Homeland Security. And there was a lot of questions around what to do with immigration data. Mm -hmm. And these are issues that are thorny issues. I did not touch that issue personally, but it would have ruined the civic tech movement of people going into government if um, it got to those really polarizing issues. And so I think this notion of data responsibility and also data storage is more critical now than ever because there is that fading of trust we're seeing right now with the polarization of the US and different beliefs that muddle uh, how people interpret and access data. Also, I just want to jump in because I, I think maybe not everyone in the audience knows um, that the Internet Archives Democracies Library program in both Canada and the United States is backing up data in the Filecoin network, in case that wasn't known. <laughs> I think we're now up to a half a petabyte, yeah. right? Yeah, we're, like, we're, we're getting there. So um, lots more data to come, but I just wanted you all to have that background as well, is that the, the programs are working together. Thanks, Jamie. And thanks, Claire. I want to double touch on something you mentioned about data privacy and talking about personhood and what that means to you all. Um, and so when I think about data, I think about issues related to privacy, um, discrimination, either purposeful or unforeseeable. So how do people working with data and emerging technology think about and incorporate personhood into the work that they're doing? So I'm happy to speak about this. Uh, Oh, okay. okay. We have five minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, uh, 
initially when the Democracies Library Program started in the United States, even though the Internet Archive has been collecting government information for quite some time, the program was launched with the support of the Filecoin Network for the Decentralized Web. And one of the first things that we did is we undertook this landscape analysis and stakeholder interviews to identify the pain points of stakeholders, to identify the challenges, to identify the threats. And, you know, one of the things that we really have to be careful of, especially when it comes to permanently backing up things, is personally identifiable information. And this is a... Uh, like very, very nuanced, complex conversation to be having when we are thinking about uh, the entitlement of certain information in certain documents related to certain issues being uh, something that the public is entitled to versus individuals being entitled to their privacy. Is it a time lag? You know, there's many different dimensions of this. So we've actually just been having conversations with human rights organizations to learn about the specific strategies that they deploy in order to omit certain data um, or just generally advise. So we're not there yet in the program in terms of the information that we're currently collecting and digitizing and uploading to Filecoin, but it is something that we're aware of. Um, you know, and I don't want to get too philosophical about the nature of personhood, um, but if you all haven't read the book Sand Talk, I was just talking about this book before we got on this panel and discussing the nature of, of the individual versus the collective and how personhood, I'll just add as like a philosophical thing to share, is um, maybe a concept that is very unique to certain cultures that in a way doesn't exist in other cultures. And so if we think about like the public, if we think about governance, if we think about togetherness, um, that may be one frame to look at what where are the boundaries between what individuals and the public are generally entitled to when it comes to working together for our collective management, oversight, and transparency? Thank you. I just have one example. Um, uh, so we've been working um, many years on different gazettes as like a popular government publication in various jurisdictions, which was meant to inform the public about things that were happening, such as you know, you know, people change their name, you know, all sorts of like uh, changes in life. Um, and they were um, distributed to libraries. So you could go to the public library, you could read it on paper. The the change uh, of format to be online, of course, it means it's uh, you can Google someone and find, find this information. So I find that a really interesting um, uh, topic and, and uh, you know, a for, uh, time change. You know, what do we do with this data? Some of our government partners, if someone uh, makes a privacy inquiry, the solution, um, easy, quick and dirty technical solution, is that entire document is out of the search engine. So, you know, how do we actually manage that long term as we get more and more data that has private information? Yeah, and just to kind of qualify what I was talking about with personhood in different cultures, the Democracies Library Program, although Canada and the United States are the programs currently underway, like the big vision, the big like North Star vision of the project is to get um, and make accessible government data from the democracies of the world. So that's going to be like th these considerations are going to be different depending upon where you are. People are going to have different expectations of their their liberties and entitlements. Yeah, and even this week um, at DWEB camp, there's there's been so many amazing groups that are actually already using Filecoin and IPFS. I was talking to a few fellows that we supported um, coming over from Malaysia who are looking at the Rohingya genocide and they're trying to back their, you know, they're stateless and they are living in a situation where they're trying to get official government data backed up so that they can actually help with what is happening on the ground there. And so when we think about governments, I would love for everyone to think beyond just traditional government entities, but also cultures and identities that have been erased from history and the importance of preserving those voices as well. Awesome. Thank you all. I think we have a few moments for any questions from the crowd. And I see a few hands that just shot up. So um, thank you. We'll go. We can go up in the front first. Hi. <clears throat> thank you very much for the talk. Um, you mentioned in a couple of different ways, loss of trust, loss of trust in institutions. Um, I suppose I'd like to understand more about how the organizations deal with mutability. Um, as in from who chooses to publish and what gets published and at what point, how much it gets edited before, how much acts information you have about the person that chose to publish it. And additionally, a common problem in journalism and truth more generally is what doesn't get published. Um, and so, you know, choosing to publish is great, but as a result, you can create a false narrative. And so I was wondering if you could talk to dealing with those problems of mutability and uh, transparency of, of the stuff that you don't have as well. So 
Um, I mean, that's a really good question, but like it's a very systems level complex, like almost insurmountable in terms of like, you can't spontaneously generate information that has not been put into form. That's like almost the role of investigative journalists to go hunt government officials down who may not be sharing critical information that the public's entitled to and getting them on record saying a thing. So like there's, there's different roles and agents and actors and entities that collaboratively work together in order to make information more publicly accessible. So I would say that some of the roles that you're hinting towards, you know, maybe being necessary because there's a problem of, you know, maybe the right information isn't being published and made accessible. is probably beyond the bounds of what the Internet Archives Democracies Library Program is going to be committed to. But there are certain ways in which we can help. For example, there's a number of different FOIA federal online archives. There's multiple ones. One of them recently got sunset. That. And so like there's just um, ways in which we can make it easier and we reduce the public burden of being able to navigate and find the information that they want to find because it's not just a problem of publications not existing, but also like the bias of not being able to discover in the first place because there's no like huge online catalog that exists that sh gives you like domain URL links to all of the 17,000 agency targets that we've personally assembled by putting together a bunch of lists. So there's just like not an easy way for people to navigate and find this information. So us aggregating this information, us creating catalogs, us combining the different FOIA archives makes it so that people are able to navigate and find information which may be not as easy to, to, to discover. Um, for the information that is not yet documented, I would leave that to investigative journalists and court system and um, other actors in like the the structure, the superstructure of democracy in order to help solicit that in order for public, the public to have access to that. I just want to say, um, uh, as we've supercharged this project, we've um, uh, sort of, I don't want to say lower the bar, um, in terms of digitizing, you know, the, the scary um, ranges in the library that don't have great metadata or the boxes in the basement, like those are now in scope, whereas before, they were not in terms of the, uh, the workflow. Um, so, you know, I always, you know, I love Erin uh, Brockovich, the movie, and I just think, what if she had full text search? Um, so, yeah. Yeah. We're good. Yeah. Okay, is that all? Already? Yeah. Any time for more questions oh, or no? Sorry, no time for. Okay, time. I, I, I'm sorry. sorry I sincerely that, apologize. Yeah. I think the panel might be available. I'm going to volunteer you guys to be okay. available to answer any questions. Thank you all for joining this morning. Um, thank you for the organizers for putting this together. Um, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Woo